Welcome to another show of Celebrate Life. My name is Gary DeCarlis, and I'll be your host today. Over the years, I've read too many obituaries that left me pondering, why did I not have a chance to meet this person? The goal of this program is to celebrate the life of everyday Vermonters. Many of them you'll still you'll know, and some of them you probably won't. But uh, I can tell you this, that everyone has a story to tell, and everyone's life is fascinating. So uh, before we start the show, if any of you would like to be a guest at, in the future, please write to me at celebratelife0747 at gmail.com, and I will gladly entertain having putting you on the schedule. And if you have a question for our guest, also write to me at celebratelife0747, and I'll make sure that uh, our guest gets that question and answers it and gets it back to you. I'm honored today to have, and I'll be very transparent, to have a close friend of mine, Mark Fanari, who I've known for over 40 years now, on our show as our guest. Welcome, Mark. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. <laughs> so we're going to celebrate your life today. Um, and let's, let's go back and tell us where it all started and what life was like back then. Mm -hmm. Well, first, it's it's an honor to be on the show. I've gotten a lot of pleasure out of watching your interviews with other, other folks. Uh, and uh, I've thought a little bit about this. You know, you gave me some great questions and uh, to think about. And I was born in the Bronx, uh, the son of an Italian-American uh, family. And um, I, um, my folks were very working class. My father worked for the New York City subway system. My mom was a housewife. She did some small, other small stuff to make some, uh, some money and stuff, but she was mostly domestically focused. Uh, I love the phrase domestic engineer because she was certainly, certainly one. <laughs> uh, very loving. I was born into an incredibly loving family and my parents had an exceptional relationship. Mm. They were deeply in love the total time they were together. Um, so that's uh, that's where but I was born in what's called Little Italy yeah. in the Bronx, a little south of Fordham University. So when you when it's nice to hear that your parents were so loving and both to themselves and to their children, what did that afford you, Mark, in your life? Oh my goodness, it was. Um, Safety, love and safety uh, in, in, you know, my nuclear family. I, uh, when I heard about other people being abused or not being well taken care of or people witnessing their parents uh, acting out or having addictions, I had the most difficult time processing it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and so I just felt fortunate and I thought everyone, this might make you laugh, but I thought everyone had parents like this. <laughs> right. <laughs> Of course. <laughs> you know, what did I know? So, yeah, your family becomes our universe in the beginning. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, so um, yeah. What was life like as a little child there in the Bronx? Um, very urban oriented. I lived at the juncture of. Uh, I lived at the juncture of the Botanical Gardens, the Bronx Zoo. Uh, and Fordham University, uh, right outside of Little Italy. I could literally walk into any of those environments in less than three minutes. Wow. You know, so it was really, but it was urban. And uh, I played a lot of, uh, you know, it was very, I'm just saying, I'm full of, uh, you know, young adults with, ch with adults with children. I played a lot of ball. I read a lot, played softball, slap ball, which is a very, urban game and stickball <laughs> yeah i played in the streets um, yeah yep. and, and until i moved to the east bronx uh when i was a little older about 10 which felt like the country i actually defined it sort of as like the country it was a, a joke to anybody who lived in a rural in a, a, a rural area <laughs> mm -hmm. so yeah so when go on that, you know, my family my, was very family oriented, you know, uh, you know, we had Sunday dinners with the extended family, motorboat trips, uh, fishing and touring on the sound, um, swimming trips to, to Jones Beach, Coney Island, um, and going to the library. I, my, my mom was a library, you know, aficionado, and she brought me to the library at five years old, and libraries have always been a huge part of my life. 
Um, so. Tell us a little bit about that Italian culture that you had. What you know, like that Sunday dinner. What was that like? It was priceless. It it started at my grandmother's, my father's family. His his father came was born in Sicily, and he um, <clears throat> he came to the United States and he opened up a barber shop in the Bronx, and uh, he married a woman who uh, ultimately came from Abruzzi, which is up in the mountains east of Rome. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that was large family gatherings. My father was one of six. My mother was one of four. And literally, you know, the tables were put together in the biggest space we would have in his house. Or sometimes the tables would take a turn into another room. <laughs> <laughs> and the food, the food was over the top. Uh -huh. you know? Yeah. And it was very much a potluck form. I didn't know that word until uh, I came to Vermont. Uh, in, the, in the early 1970s, but um, it was very much a potluck. Uh, you know, the host Everyone had, brought, this, yeah, people brought stuff, you know, yeah, yeah. the stuff they had made, the food was excellent. And mm -hmm. I had cousins, lots of cousins, and, you know, it mm -hmm. was it was pretty sweet, I have to tell you. Well, that's that's <laughs> wonderful. Sweet. That's Thanks. wonderful. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, that little boy growing up in the Bronx, what did he, when you, thought about what you wanted to do when you grew up? What were some of your early career fantasies? Oh, my goodness. My goodness. I, I, my father worked for the subway system. So initially, I wanted to be a railroad engineer. I'd drive a railroad train. Mm -hmm. um, I thought about becoming a physician, uh, you know, and I actually was a pre-med student when I first went to college. And walking across the U.S. was always an ambition. And I thought about becoming a librarian. Um, those were early things that I, I wanted to yep. do. I also told my father when I was 12 that I wanted to be a priest, which fits into a whole, he, he, he wisely told me to think about it for a few years and he would help me if, <laughs> if that's something that I still wanted to do. Uh, but it is connected to some, to my life later on that urge to what was embedded in there, you know, it's connected. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So, I loved it. Uh, you know, I loved be just dreaming about what I could do. Um, I still think about walking across the U.S. The other day I was I was thinking about it and I said, OK, how fast could I do this? How many miles a day? You know, hmm. Do I want company? <laughs> still on the bucket list. Still on the bucket list. <laughs> well, I do about 30 or 40 miles a day now. Wow. Um, so, you know, I no mean, kidding. Oh yeah, I've been doing. I've been, you know, in, intensely involved in walking as an activity for years. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, I love it. And so, um, grammar school, high school, what were those years like? I went to a parochial, a Catholic uh, uh, parochial school, twelve years for both elementary school and high school. Um. It's a parochial education, you know, parochial is defined by narrow, narrow interests. And um, I, uh, you know, I, I did the best I could. I was a pretty high academic learner in, in, high, in elementary school. And uh, I won an award, you know, when we graduated from elementary school. But I, I chose the wrong high school and uh, a parochial school, a Catholic high school. Uh, and um, I didn't realize it. I knew something was wrong, I, you know, but I didn't know how to separate myself from that experience. I could have, my, my parents would have intervened, but I was too uh, conscious that the admission of that might be seen as a failure. Uh -huh. and so I just went slowly downhill. What was, what was wrong about it? What, what didn't fit? Well, I didn't really buy the whole religious uh, education piece. Uh, I, it didn't pass. I was a science mate. I love science. And it didn't pass what I, you know, uh, what I respectfully call the straight face test. It didn't mm -hmm. make any sense at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and I didn't know what to do with it because on one hand earlier, I wanted to become a priest. And then right. all of a sudden, three or three, four years later, I was looking around saying, what am I going to do now? You know, I'm not going to, uh, I made up my mind not to go to a Catholic uh, university. A religious right. experience. Yeah. You know, one great decision. <laughs> <laughs> so you grew past that 
I want to be a priest. Let's go to Catholic school. Of course, that would support that. And right. then that mind started working yes. and the science mind started working, saying something's wrong here. Something, this doesn't connect. It doesn't yeah. connect. And there, there were, there was, a, <clears throat> it was a, there was a teacher, a, a sister, her name was Kathleen Donnelly. She was my eighth grade teacher. She became president of a high, uh, principal of a high school nearby, all girls. She was the person I really started to turn toward uh, history with her. She turned, mm. she turned the class's attention toward civics and history in the modern world and, you know, JFK and, uh, you know, she was, uh, she was quite a force. And I, I, I held on to that. Um, yep. When high school was, I wasn't really um, inspired at all in high school. Uh, so, uh, which is unfortunate. I could have gone a couple of other places. Right, right. Yeah. Now you said you won an award in grammar school. What was that? It was, you know, uh, achievement for excellence, you know, studies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You were smart. Yeah, when we graduated, a number a number of people received awards, and I yes. was one. Of them. Yeah. yeah, oh great, yeah. and that was fun. <clears throat> in high school, I was you know not a not you know not an achiever, although you know, I was on the chess club and I enjoyed that and and stuff. But mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I was going to ask you: Were there any clubs or um, areas that you really sports or things that you got into during those years that? <clears throat> Yeah, that's a good question. I didn't even think about that. I ran track, um, 440 relay and later cross country for a while. Uh, and that was really good. It, it really brought me away from um, <clears throat> um, sort of hanging out with the wrong people in high school, taking on some poor habits. Like I became a smoker in high school and I started to drink when I was 16 or 17 years old, you know, like many of my friends. And those became um, abusive situations later on. I had to really consciously change those. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But I didn't, you know, I was really interested in chess, pocket billiards, hiking, uh, the natural world. I was always looking, you know, I was out at all the parks in, yep. in New York doing doing different things with my friends. And I, I loved it, you know, I loved it. Mm. And, and um, when you got your driver's license, did that give you a freedom that you could get out of the city? Oh, yeah, my driver's license. I wasn't in a hurry right away. I wasn't in a hurry. I got my driver's license kind of when I was 17 because I was still discovering New York City using the mass transit system and going places downtown to Greenwich Village. Uh, looking at art, art stuff, looking at the City University of New York, which I ultimately went to, and just discovering the city and saying, whoa, this is amazing, you know, yeah. and so I, I wasn't, I went, and when I got a license, I started to go uh, with my friends, go to natural um, uh, areas, you know, uh, large parks out in Jersey, upstate New York, uh, up in Connecticut, up in the northwest corner of Connecticut, where it meets Massachusetts, I started just yeah. traveling around. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great. So you went to City College in New York? Yeah, I went to yeah. City College. And you were a pre-med major? Yeah, I started as a science major, pre-med concentration. Yeah. And I uh, had a, and I had a, um, <clears throat> an evolution, a revolution there, you know, but it was re the, definitely the right place for me. And uh, I discovered that uh, the anti-war movement was more important to me than uh, the study of medicine at that time. And I moved over to being a history major. A little bit of Sister Kathleen's push. I, I became a history major thinking right. I would you know, ultimately do <clears throat> maybe teach or what have you. And, right. <clears throat> and I love the city university because of the diversity, you know, people from different ethnic yeah. groups, you know, Asian, yeah. Asian, um, Hispanic, African-American, um, just, you know, Italian. I was, yeah, I mean, out of the school I, I graduated from, there were probably three um, people of color in the school out of 250 uh, high school students. And I was on the track team with two of them, uh, but they weren't close friends of mine. When I got to college though, I had lots of friends and mm. different people that I could hang out with who had really different up, you know, upbringings than I did. Yes, yes. Changed my life, you know. Yes. We'll see. It was a revolution, you know. <laughs> yes. And those were the days of the Vietnam War was raging. Yeah. 
the days of the Vietnam War, I was profoundly influenced by that war uh, in so many ways. Um, I, Talk uh, about that a little bit. Oh my goodness. Huh. Oh my goodness, you know. Well, you know, you're you're close to my age. You know, I watched, you know, the war was on television. The death and destruction that we rained uh, on innocent people was on television. And my father was a decorated World War II hero, uh, a member of um, Israeli, uh, he not, wasn't Jewish, but he was in, for, for, for uh, saving Jewish concentration camp victims as a medic. He was awarded a Righteous Among Nations. He was a proud World War II veteran. Yep. Uh, and the war, uh, the war, the Vietnam War was, tra was a travesty. And it impacted me, you know. Matter of fact, I'll, can I tell you a short story? Sure, absolutely. <clears throat> One day shortly after I started going to college, there was a protest movement right in front of the school. And somebody was singing with a guitar and singing any war songs. And I was with some friends from high school who came to visit me. You know, we went, I went outside and they started making fun of this person and jeering them. And he had two guitars with him. One he was playing and another one leaning against a fire hydrant. I picked up the one against the fire hydrant and broke it over the fire hydrant. Wow. And, wow. walked away, and walked away. Wow. Wow. But the story doesn't end there. Next, the next semester, I'm in an organic chemistry class in the first couple of days. And this fellow sits next to me in the room. You know, he sits right next to me and starts talking to me. And we're back and forth and stuff. And it's right before lunch. And he says, what are you doing right now? I said, I don't know. I said, I'm not doing anything. He goes, you want to get a sandwich together? I said, I love that. You know, so we went. Uh, off campus a little bit, this, a couple of blocks away, we're sitting down and was talking. We're starting to know each other. And he said to me, um, he said, do you remember me? And I said, no, have we met before? And he said, yes. He said, we met out in the street in the spring. He said, you broke my guitar over a fire hydrant. Oh my goodness. And I looked at him and I was, I was like, you know, a number of a months passed by. Really? And I said, oh my goodness. I said, I'm sorry, oh my, oh my word. I said, let me buy you lunch and I'll replace your guitar. And he said, he's nodding his head. And he says, I'll tell you what, he said, buy me lunch. I don't want my guitar replaced. He said, it wasn't that good of a guitar anyway. Mm -hmm. And I said, I started laughing. I said, I don't even know what to say to you. And he said to me, I'll tell you what, all is forgiven if you can come with me to a meeting. Because do you know anything about the Vietnam War? And I said, no, I don't. And he said to me, if you come to a meeting with me, one meeting, he goes, we're square. I said, okay, where am I going? He said, the organization is called Students for a Democratic Society. Okay, yeah. And he said, I'd like you to come with me. I said, okay, yeah. I went and it changed my life. Wow. wow. The people who were there, what they were doing, what they were, how they were talking about the world. Right. The women, the women were like, whoa. You know, I had never seen women like this before. Right. And um, it was just, you know, incredible. That's so, um, wow. Did you, th th has this person stayed in your life at all, Mark? After No, 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 mm -hmm. no. Stephen Moritz, Steve. I think his last name was Moritz. Stephen was his first name. Right. We didn't stay friends because, you know, <clears throat> we just didn't. But he right. he was so, um, you know, he had an agenda and that's yeah. okay yeah. because, yeah. but he gave me an, a, a way to make amends. Yeah, he sure did. And he, that, that um, emotional maturity to be able to say, let's go out and have lunch, you know, spotting you and going out to have lunch. No, I don't sense any anger or, you know, animosity no. whatsoever just uh, an open door an open invitation and wow yeah yeah and, and it changed and, my life yeah. it changed your life absolutely it, that was one of the you know situations there have been many that have changed my life and it helped shape what became sort of my operational uh, how would you say uh i don't know mission in the world yeah uh, yeah have you paid that forward in life and yourself by any <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Many times I love pay I love um 
you know, I love, I've done many, many different things. And my operative word is discovery. Yes. You know, I'm, cu I'm curious almost to a fault sometimes and discovery. And also I'm addicted to transformation, both my own and helping other people. Mm -hmm. For me, it's a passion. Uh, if I can facilitate someone else's transformation in a respectful way. Um, and that yeah. became my work later on, you know, yeah. that became. My yeah, work. absolutely. Yeah. What an amazing story. Thank you for sharing that. Oh, you're welcome. I haven't. It brings a tear to my eye, a little a choke mm. in the chest. Yeah, yeah, you. yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I think so, about the splinter walking away, breaking someone's a piece Nick's guitar over a fire hydrant, and then walking away. Right. You know what do you do with that? Right. <laughs> so wow. And yeah, I mean, is that, that can go? That's just an amazing story. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Ben. So, um, so you graduated, and then what? Oh, I was. It was you know, it was the anti-war movement was in full bloom. The year was 1970. I uh, filled out a conscientious objection form and applied to uh, applied to Canadian for Canadian immigrancy, and I was in going along in those processes. And those are long stories, but I, uh, I the lottery came about and I drew a high number, mm -hmm. and I drew a I drew a buy. I threw number 326, and if you were in the top, the high third, you weren't going to get drafted. Right. I had a girlfriend who later became my wife, and uh, we, did, we were reading about the Back to the Land movement. And uh, we had traveled across cross country on two large camping trips uh, in one summer, and I loved national parks. You know, I just loved being out of New York and being in the yeah. rest of the world. Yeah. So we decided to buy a farm in upstate New York with a with a dozen with a four, not a dozen with four other people. We bought a seventy acre ten room house, seventy acre farm with a ten room house on it uh, in upstate New York, and moved there completely. After I had been working in New York City, I came back and I worked a year and a half, put some money together in the New York City Health and Hospital Corporation, and uh, that was was a good thing because the year was. I worked there when the abortion became legal in 1970, and um, and so I that started me on my path outside of New York and, and away and away from living in New York City. Thrilled, I was thrilled. radical too. Radical, upstate really. New York, 70 acre farm. Yes, yeah, wow. it was an old dairy farm, had a, a a small a small barn. I think a small a small barn was still on it, or it might have just been a large shed, and the barn had burned down. Yeah, and how much did you pay for that? <laughs> I paid. Um, you're gonna cry. <laughs> <laughs> Nineteen thousand dollars. <laughs> Great, unbelievable. You know, yeah, yeah. Stayed there for a year and a half or two years. Uh, and then we found out how much we didn't know. You know, I went to graduate school up in Buffalo then uh, to get my teaching certi sort of, uh, certificate and taught in a local school. Hmm. Uh, you know, but what we didn't know, we didn't understand what we were really doing and the kind of uh, emotional communicative skill you need to live with a group of strangers in close proximity, <clears throat> you know, in a, in a big house on an isolated piece of land, trying to go back to the land, whatever that meant. Right, yeah. right, yeah. from the kid from Bronx. Kid from the Bronx. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, you never know how much you don't know until you step into a foreign world. <laughs> you go, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and that, so how did you get to Vermont? Um, we made a decision to end, end the relationship around the group, the group ownership of the farm. We sold it and I had, uh, we were, I was interested in going up to the Northern Adirondacks and, and Mary, my first wife and I said, yeah, let's do that. So we went up to uh, Potsdam, Canton and Potsdam. We knew they were university towns and we were drawn to university towns because we wanted the diversity of in people, we wanted young people around. We wanted the ability to take courses and, and discourse. Sure. 
And so I went to Potsdam and I got offered a, an adjunct faculty position teaching history, starting out, you know, with practically no money at all. We were renting a small place, uh, sort of, I'm going to be complimentary and call it a reconverted chicken coop. And, uh, and uh, we, we were renting a place and we had a friend <clears throat> here who I knew from New York City in Burlington uh, a number of years ago who went out with a friend of Mary's. Uh, yeah, and he, and we, and she invited us to come over here. It was the September of 1973. Yeah. It was over Labor Day weekend and we came over here. Uh, wonderful woman. Uh, and uh, she put us up for a weekend. I, <clears throat> I looked around in Burlington and thought about where I was and looked at Mary and said, this is no, there's <laughs> no comparison here. Yeah. Let's move now. Yeah. And so wow. that's what we did, you know, yep. we, went, we went back, we packed up our stuff. We, and within five days, we had moved back to Burlington and Deborah put us up for a while until we found another space. Yes. And then Mary went to work for the free press and I went to, I went to work all, to, all at the same time for the, uh, the People's Free Clinic, which was the pre precursor to the Community Health Center mm -hmm. uh, and, and the Onion River, Onion River Food Cooperative. Uh, I was one of the managers there and helped build it and uh, and also worked on a little newspaper, a little local newspaper that was an absolute rag. <laughs> so you, uh, you, I think you're being a little modest on the Onion River Co-op there. Um, you were right in the beginning of that, weren't you, Mark? Yeah, pretty close to the beginning. Certainly, um, my friend John and I started the Produce Co-op. We did. We started a lot of the initiatives. It was really a, a grain, uh, a grain uh, bulk order cooperative. Right. When I right. first discovered it, a friend of mine, Larry Kufferman, was the uh, one one of the original members. With a woman, I'm forgetting her name right now. We were in the early, we were in the early formative stages. Is it the Archibald Street property that? Um... That you have yeah, all we, the big bags in there and all that stuff. No, you've got a great memory. You're right. We, I lived upstairs there with Larry, and we were renting the space, and the building came up for sale, and I put up the money to buy the building. Mm -hmm. I had cash left over from the farm in Western New York State, and I said, Larry, I'll, I'll lend the co-op some money. I know the co-op can pay me back. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened. We bought that building, Archibald Street. Wow. Wow. Amazing. Right. God, you're bringing back some of the best memories, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> That's the point of the show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is great. These are great memories. Thank you. Yeah. So you settled into Burlington. Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. I settled in Burlington and I started to get involved in local, local stuff going on, you know, and my nature, I started to get involved in political stuff too, mm -hmm. uh, which was really good, you know, Liberty Union Party. I remember when uh, friends, later friends, began to run for office. Bernie Sanders. I got to. I met Bernie there. Set up doing some work with him and working on his campaigns later. Good man. Uh, mm -hmm. Tremendous integrity. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I started to, you know, do stuff in town and uh, and uh, yeah. And then I got involved in a political movement that was based on uh, a. Um, Socialism, actually, it was a uh, it was a an America a new American Communist Party. It wasn't the Communist Party USA. It was the Communist Party Marxist Leninist, and uh, it believed it leaned more toward what was going on in China as a model than what was going on in the Soviet Union. And I didn't really know much about this, but I I figured I was would learn I would learn. So I was a bit impulsive, and I got involved in this. And I learned a lot. I learned that, you know, um, I learned to avoid uh, political cults, cults that respect autocrats. Um, and, um, you know, I stayed with them and did some, I did some union organizing, went to work at the hospital for a while. So I went back into hospital work, um, which was really fun. I met some good people. Mm -hmm. I started doing that work and the union organizing work was really good. This is when the Service Employees International Union, this is before the hospital uh, staff, a lot of the staff, particularly nursing staff was uh, union represented by a union. Right, right. Yep. yeah. Yeah, yep. so I got involved in that and stuff. And that led me to, the political stuff led me to working with the city council, which is how I, you know, I met you. I, you exactly. were on the, 
on the city council and I became a staff person for the city council for, mm. for a That's number right. of years. Did some good work. I did. I enjoyed that work. I enjoyed all the different people. You did a lot of constituent work, if I'm not mistaken. You did. Yeah, it did. You were very um, influential and pointed me in a couple of different directions. One was encouraging me to take some mediation classes, which mm -hmm. changed my life. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So, Mark, um, if we just pause for a second, I mean, I, you know, if you believe in that notion that we all are a combination of all kinds of people in our life that we build upon. Who were some of your mentors? Some of the people that you um, you worked with, looked up to, learned from, grew from, that really helped make you who you are today. There are there are so many. There are so many. Um, I'm still trying to do that. You know, when I find someone who knows more than I know about something, I just that curiosity comes right out, you know, and I want to know how they structure themselves and their priorities. Um, but, you know, later, I think that when I was younger, it, you know, it was, you know, I said that that sister was Ike Eisenhower. I remember liking him, Martin Luther King. I remember a lot who he influenced me, the Kennedy brothers. But, you know, in terms of vocational stuff, you know, um, Susan Terry, who had headed the Woodbury program as a mediator, made a huge difference in my life because um, she watched me work for a while and she really questioned whether I really wanted to be a mediator. Could I stop? Could I learn how to be, uh, stop being an advocate at time and learn how to learn neutrality? Enough to convince someone who I disagreed with that I, un that I understood them perfectly and that they should hire me to be their lawyer. Mm. You know, she actually yeah. used those words. Wow. And I said, wow. I said, that's what I need to do. She said, if you want to be a mediator, if you want it to be effective, that's what you need to be able to do. Uh -huh. So she was one of, she was a beacon for me. Oh, that's you know, interesting. she yes. was a beacon in terms of how to take the neutral ground mm -hmm. uh, and stuff. And the city councilors, whether it was you or, Oh my God, I'm remembering some of the folks I used to work with, you know, Earhart Monka and who I really loved Earhart and working with him. And it was a woman, Zoe Briner. Zoe Briner, Zoe, right. Zoe Russ, a Rick Musty. Loved oh. Rick. You yeah. Know? yeah. And, and the people that got that came in later on, you know. Yeah. Um, I worked with great people at City Hall uh, who were staff. Mike Monty learned a lot from Michael Monty. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, it was, uh, it was good, good folks. Stuff. Good folks. Yeah. And then I turned yeah. towards psychology later. I started to move away from that experience, the political experience. Mm -hmm. And tell us about that a little bit. Well, <clears throat> what happened was um, I found political analysis wanting for me. It didn't give me an understanding of people and why they did things. Like I, you know, I saw people in political parties, you know, and while I was staff person for the city council, I did some work for Democrats and Republicans, not just progressives then at that time, or independents. And uh, I, I really wanted the human piece. Um, because I, people could do work, but I didn't see that people became easily transformed by political um, identification. Mm -hmm. That there was something deeper going on. Mm -hmm. and I said, I've, I've got to find out what this is about. And it was through mediating and doing, starting to do divorce work and community-based mediation for the Burlington Mediation Project, which is, I, that was one of the things I started with a friend of mine, uh, Ellen Bernstein. And, um, I realized that I needed to, uh, it was, I was co-mediating, doing a, a mediation dispute. And my co-mediator, very bright woman, uh, said to me, she Mark, you are driven for, to psychological analysis. Do you know that about yourself? And I said, no, I don't. I only took a, a, you know, a, a, a broad introductory course in psychology when I was in college, but I really, the, the professor wasn't that, good and I wasn't that interested in it. She said, I recommend that you take some courses, take a couple of courses. Mm. I said, really? She goes, 
yeah, you, you would, you're going to like it a lot because the questions you ask. And that's what happened. Um, uh, yeah. I turned away from politics because, in, in, I'm going to say something. I don't mean it at, in, uh, in you know, a way that's anything, but um, appreciative for the people who do the work. Sure. Um, I found it superficial, the political work. Mm-hmm. And I wanted something that went deeper. Right. And, you know, and then I oh. also had my own process, my own, you know, moving away from uh, uh, substance use and mm-hmm. understanding that in a deeper way. Mm-hmm. So the politics stuff is an external thing. It's out there. It doesn't. Yes. Uh, and you. it sounds like you turned in. Right. Who yes. am I? What am I all about? And what are you all? What are you all about underneath <laughs> the label? Yes. 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 Absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. It was it was hard for me to turn in and leave the other behind because I had spent years developing myself as an agent for external change and had made fabulous, wonderful, become friends with fabulous people, uh, highly motivated, skilled human beings. And I found myself moving away from that. And there was a loss there. Uh, yeah, of, yeah. Um, I, I understand that. Yeah, huh. yeah, there's a loss there. And uh, Interesting. So, yeah, and then you have, you did quite a bit of work in mediation, yeah. way beyond the, the that, that certificate or degree that you got, right. um, even till recently, how you've done a lot of that kind of work, Mark. Well, yeah, it was really interesting because the mediation took me into conflict resolution in the workplace. It, and uh, because I was a mediator, people would hire me. And I had I, I was hired by some amazing people. Uh, Beth Sachs and Blair Hamilton, the, the founders of Vermont Energy Investment Corporation. I worked with that company for nine or 10 years with their senior staff. And what happened was I was I, I changed and I became a, um, I went from becoming a workplace consultant uh, looking at conflict resolution to really assisting people in leading in a more appropriate way. So it became leadership development, coaching people who were executives, managers, team leaders. And I, then I became, I hit, I hit heaven when I, because I became friends with people who were doing that work prior, longer than I have. Mm. And just wonderful human beings, um, both Peter Cole, certainly a mentor, and another one, another person who I'm forgetting right now, Marilyn, I'm forgetting your name. It's aging, you know. What can I tell you? <laughs> and uh, and I learned from those people what tools to use and really how to do the work. Mm-hmm. And I've been doing that work actually since, you know, really engaged in leadership development work. Still do some mediation and conflict resolution in, in, in the workplace. I moved away from doing uh, counseling. I only did counseling work, like traditional therapy work, for about a year. And I found that I didn't like the 50-minute hour uh, I wasn't interested in doing, seeing people that way and working with people that way all the time. Uh, right. And so I moved toward workplace stuff, which is what I've been, Yeah, I'm still doing it. Yeah. I yeah. love doing it. Oh, that's great. <laughs> now you've got three daughters, if I'm not mistaken. Three and daughters. Yeah. And they're close by. Tell me yeah, they were friends. all over the country. They yeah. were all over the country and California, you know, New York, Boston, Chicago, you know, way at college. And then four years ago, yeah, about four years ago, they started to move back. They said they're coming, they're moving to Burlington. Mm-hmm. I got to tell you, I was a little surprised because I thought they were, you know, they had made lives in these other locations and had friends. They had some great friends. And they started to move back. My oldest daughter moved back, stayed for a summer, and her and her future husband loved it here. They, they're, they're here now. They, have, they just had their first child here. Now they just had their second child two months ago, all boys. And then my uh, middle daughter moved here with her son and just had another child, two boys. Um, and my third daughter moved here after college, and she's still here, although... Are they all going to stay here for their lives? Well, who knows? Who knows? Right. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. nice. It's wonderful having them around, I have to tell you. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. It's, you know, yeah. it's, it's a real treat. And uh, as a grandfather with all those little boys running around. Oh, my God. 
I, I you know, I see, I do a lot of grandparent duty. Uh -huh. It's a joy. It's yeah. a real joy. I yeah. can imagine. Well, it good is. For you. This afternoon, I'll be with uh, my gr my grandson Luca, who's named after my father, um, mm. who lived to be just a little short of a hundred, and um, <clears throat> I'll spend a few hours with him this afternoon. Well, you know, he'll tear me up. <laughs> he's like 18 he, he'll tear me up he's 15 months old i can barely keep up with him <laughs> he's he's on the he's walking now oh yeah yeah, yeah. So he's he all over the place <laughs> yeah he doesn't stop he has a great uh spirit you'd love it gary it's um oh it's just a beautiful spirit um he doesn't stop and he's in he's glee you know that's great oh yeah yeah, yeah that's really wonderful great. mark it's wonderful thanks so, for asking about them Oh, absolutely. Um, so if you, what what kind of, couple of things here. One, what, when you think about your life, um, is there a, a quote or a piece of wisdom that you would share with other people that kind of capture what your life's been about and what others could benefit from? Yeah, you know, there are a few things. Um, the first thing is I, I have a quote, it's on the bottom of my email. And many people talk to me about it. They say they like it. It says, do you, do you, it's in those individuals whose thoughts or behaviors challenge us have a per potential to be our greatest teachers. Mm. And I really believe that, you know, when I don't understand someone, I, you know, I might get irritated initially. I might start to lose patience a little bit. There's an internal part of me that says, wait a minute, Mark, what are you gonna learn? I'm addicted to learning. That's, I mean, I love it. And so what are you gonna learn? What's this person going to teach you? Mm. you know? And as opposed to saying, you know, this person's a, well, you fill in the spot, you fill in the line. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I've got something to learn here. What's it gonna mm. be? And mm. I go, and that's, my, and that's a great feed for my curiosity. And I am patient, sometimes I'm impulsive, but I'm basically a patient person. And I like to be, uh, to think things through and be insightful, be less impulsive. And the other thing is you asked me, what would be my words to people out there? You know, my, you know, is to integrate um, the pursuit of joy um, and purpose into your life. Mm -hmm. That I think in this culture, you know, particularly if you're a man growing up when we grew up, you know, you were the, your your males around you met, um, mentored and modeled being the breadwinner right. a lot you know right. and you know at the sacrifice of pursuing joy in your life and what brings you happiness and and developing emotional in, uh, capacity emotional intelligence a lot of men our age you know this uh their emotional intelligence is um is compromised mm -hmm. um, you know, and I don't mean they're bad people. That's, that's not at all. No, I understand. I, yes, they're good people. They're, you yep. know, everybody's trying to do their best. But, you know, emotional intelligence is a whole skill set. And, you know, in, in the workplace, I think it's valued, being valued more and more. Mm -hmm. uh, if you have emotional intelligence, you know, you're a valuable part of a team. Absolutely. You can lead. You, you can lead a team of people. Yep. Uh, if you don't yep. have emotional intelligence and you're focused on data, or just content, or you, you're driving for results all the time. Um, you know, you're gonna miss something. Yes. I don't. Is that what you were looking for? Oh no, it's really up. It's it's you, it, and that's it's, I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank, thank I, you. You know, I, when I listening to you, I made it made me go back to that guitar incident, and wondering if you challenged that guy who was playing music on the on campus if he was curious to learn something from what you did. Yes. That you might've yeah. taught him something during that whole thing too. Yeah. He, he I mean, he was very, he, as you said it before, he was very present. I mean, in a way that was unusual then. Like I never knew about his family. You know, it was interesting is like, where did he develop that kind of presence from? You know, but he, he, he asked questions. He was patient, he listened. You know, he was curious about my life. And he said to me, I mean, you don't really know much about the Vietnam War, do you? Oh. Mm -hmm. 
he forced me to be yeah. self-reflective. Yeah. Yeah, right. And I said, no, I have to be honest. I don't know much about it. That's why I destroyed your guitar. (laughs) Exactly. So what an embarrassment, you know? Wow. So we're getting towards the end of the interview. Is there anything we've missed that you would like to talk about, about your life? Hmm. Well, my, you know, I would go back to my to my family uh, a little bit because this is where it all began for me. With my mom, particularly, and my father, they really practiced integrity, being generous, and compassion. You know, when I read about those later on, I recently I just p- finished a book by the Dalai Lama. Talk about somebody who can influence your life. It was that you'd love it. It's an exchange. I recommend it for anyone. It's called The Book of Joy. It, it's, a, it's a dialogue between the Dalai Lama and um, Archbishop Tutu, a facilitated wow. dialogue. And out of it came the book. Wow. It's a wow. I, you, you listen to them talking. I mean, I, I used, did it as an audio book because you can hear Tutu he, in his voice. And there's an, um, an Asian uh, uh, man translating the Dalai Lama. And it, you can read it too, and that's fine too, but you can put right. that, you know, the voices in there, but you, you get the emotion um, by listening to it and the deep, the deepest respect that these people have. And it reminded me of my parents. I said, you know, my father, here's a beauty. My father, they were religious people. My mom was a Eucharistic minister for the Catholic church. Um, my dad, later in life, my dad and her went to a tour of Israel and Egypt when he was on tour and they were going through the working class and poor areas of Egypt. All he was doing was giving away money. Hmm. He yeah. wasn't satisfied unless his wallet was empty when he right. got back to the hotel. Wow. Yeah. No. Yeah. You know, what can you say, you know, than that? So I think that's what I would say there and mm. try things, challenge you, you know, mm. be curious. Um, I, you know, got to find that the. Um, the purpose in life. Yeah, you got to find the, the, the Japanese call Ikigai, I-K-I-G-A-I. And it's about the essence of achieving the er- external expression about the internal integrity and values you have. Mm. Not that you're not going to make a mistake. Mm-hmm. We are right. all the time. Like I'm going to make a mistake today. I don't know what it is. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Yeah. But that I think if you're pursuing that and you're looking for it, you know, you'll find it. Yeah. Do you? So at this point in your life, are do you feel like you've queued up all that internal stuff with what you do in the external world? I'm still working. I'm still working on it. I have a new, very sweet, uh, new relationship in my life. Uh, very, very, very nice woman. And she, her interests are different than mine and overlap. And she's taking me in a different, a different direction, you know, through my friendship with her. And um, I'm queuing up something else. You know, I think um, I'm going to do more of the same of what I've been doing the last few years, working with people and transforming themselves. And uh, and transforming myself in the process and spending more time in nature, even more. You know, I, I was a beekeeper at one time for a number of years, and I I'm just looking into getting a hive. My my grandson, my eldest grandson, said bees. He calls me Oopy. It's a long story. And and <laughs> um, and I, he says Oopy, you're gonna have bees. And I said, yeah, I'm gonna have bees in the backyard. I'm gonna show you how to open a hive. Wow. He's like, are we going to get stung? I said, maybe, but probably not. Mm-hmm. Do bees hurt? I said, eh, it can hurt. I said, you got to get the stinger out right away. I said, yep, yeah, it'll hurt a little bit, but don't worry about it. I'll show you what I do. Mm-hmm. Lives are like this. Wow. <laughs> you know? It was really fun, you know? So, so maybe these grandchildren might be your way of paying it forward, Mark. 
Yes. You know, someone just asked me, said, Mark, you have you have four sons. You had three daughters. You know, what do you think of that? And I said, I said this to my daughters and their families, too. I said, look, our job, I said, when you were young, the daughters, our job was to raise strong, resilient, smart young women who would not back down easily. They could they could push back. And with men, it's develop strong, competent, emotionally savvy men who are also sensitive, Mm -hmm. you know, and treat women, listen to women, treat them with respect. That's the only way I can pay it forward to my dad. There there you go. That's my my dad. Yep. Yep. That's nice. I love that. That's a great, that's a good one. I like that. Mm. Um, Yeah. Any last, (laughs) any last words you want to part? Any last words? I don't think so. Let me think. I've said so much. I was wondering when I started this interview, Gary, Mark, what are you going to say? You have hardly anything to say. You You have a great life story, Mark. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Um, Last words are don't be afraid to start something new, even when you're older. Like I got into uh, uh, real estate stuff and development and, and, and stuff when I was 50. 50 years old. Yeah. And and I'm, se- I'm 76 now, and I'm really happy I did it for a number of reasons. Yeah. Um, I was flying to Mexico. Man sitting next to me is active in real estate in Dallas and, and Mexico, near, in, near San Miguel Allende. He started asking me what I do. I started asking him what he does. At the end of the conversation, we exchanged emails. He gave me a tour in Mexico of real estate stuff that he was up to with a partner. And I said, you know, Stephen, why did you want to do this? And he said to me, I can't believe that you got involved in this stuff when you were 50 years old. Mm. Most people are hanging. They're not interested in that at all. I said, got it. So that's my parting words. Don't be afraid. There you go. That's great parting words. Thank you, Mark. It's great having you on the show. Yeah, thank you, Gary. This was a, this was a pleasure. Thank you, thank you for bringing back all these memories. Appreciate it. You're more than welcome.